Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are joining us from. Uh, so welcome to our webinar titled uh, Major Global Events that Impacted Agricultural Trade in 2022 and Prospects for 2023. I'm your host, Ben Latigan. I'm a Global Market Analyst here at Tridge in the Product Growth Department. And uh, we have a very large uh, and diverse group of, of people joining us today from all over the globe, from, from different time zones. And we're very excited to, to host you and uh, for you to join us for the last webinar uh, of the year, for the last Tridge webinar of the year. Before we get started, I would like to just quickly talk about the intelligence and data um, division here at Tridge and, and what we offer. So as an intelligence and uh, sourcing provider, we deliver the most timely and valid information um, and analysis on the agricultural industry as we have a vast global network uh, of experts that are actively engaging in the in the industry. Now, our intelligence includes daily, daily analysis on price, regulation, production, seasonality, and more uh, to help our clients understand the market and improve their decision-making skills. So if you have any further interest in uh, our data and intelligence solutions, please feel free to, to visit our website. So before we, before we get started, I uh, just want to get some technical aspects out of the way. So for the most optimal viewing experience, uh, click, please click on the view options menu at the top of your meeting um, window and then enable the side by side view so you can view both the presentation and the speakers during, during the event. Uh, there's also a real time translation and transcription service. Um, if you select the closed captions, uh, and then you can select the language that you want the, the, um, the speech translated to or the, the, yeah, the transcription service that you want. So if any, and if you need any further technical assistance, uh, please use the chat, chat feature uh, at the, yeah, please use a chat, chat feature and a Tridge member will reach out to you and assist you uh, where needed. And during the webinar, if you have any questions uh, that you hope to be addressed uh, uh, in the Q&A session afterwards, if you have time, we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. So if you have any questions that pop up through the webinar, uh, please put them in the chat and we will see if we can address them as well. And uh, please remember to keep yourselves on mute throughout the presentation. Uh, for this webinar, we also offer a certificate of attendance. So if you would like a certificate of attendance, um, there's a there's a, um, uh, a, a survey at the end. Uh, the link will be provided at the end for the survey and it will uh, be included in the follow up information. So if you'd like a certificate of attendance, please complete that survey um, and a certificate of attendance will be will be sent to you. So for today, we will be looking back at, at 2022. What happened in 2022? And what are the prospects for 2023? And we will be covering uh, two major sections. We will look at the main events in the citrus trade, and we will also be looking at the main events in the in the global nut trade. Uh, and then we'll look at what may, what were the major events that happened in in this year, and what are the expectations for 2023? And then we'll also have a panel discussion at the end. Uh, we will we address we will, we will we address further uh, further qu questions. Uh, I'm your host, Ben Latigan. I'm not going to hamper too much on, on myself, and I'm going to move on to, to introduce our speakers for the day. Um, I'm going to ask each speaker to introduce themselves um, at a later stage, but we have two global market analysts with us today, Theo and Juan, and then we also have Lucia, a global logistics specialist with us, and then we have Mehmet and Elton uh, from the global fulfillment uh, side, from the fulfillment side as global fulfillment managers. Uh, so we have five speakers uh, in total today. Um, Theo will cover um, the nuts, the nut section. Juan Carlos will cover the citrus section, um, and Lucia, Mehmet, and Elton uh, will be our will serve as our panelists for today. So for the main events, in, main events in the citrus trade in 2022 and expectations for 2023, I'm going to hand over to Juan. Uh, Juan, please introduce yourself briefly, um, what you do at Tridge, um, what your role is, and then let's jump into the presentation itself. Thank you very much, Ben. 
Yes, hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining the, the webinar. So we will be reviewing the uh, in my in my side the main events in Citrus Trade in 2022 and the expectations in 2023. I am a global market analyst here at Reach. I cover uh, the fruit and vegetable section uh, globally, um, and we mainly uh, participate in, in in all the generate the content generation that you can see in the in the market uh, intelligence channel at our platform. Um, so with more, much further ado, uh, we will review the main global events in the citrus industry. Much of these events, I want to say, uh, of course, they are uh, they cover all other industries uh, beyond uh, the, the fresh uh, fruit and vegetables industry. Um, however, we will be reviewing the citrus uh, global industry for now um, from those main global events that happened in 2022. Uh, we have selected four main global events. Of course, uh, all through the webinar, we will probably be speaking about uh, some other specific uh, global events in specific markets that have uh, also affected the global uh, citrus industry. Uh, however, we will be uh, talking mainly about these four global events, which is the Russia-Ukraine conflict, of course, uh, which is probably one of the best, uh, or one of the major uh, events that happened this year, since the beginning of the year. Uh, we will be talking, of course, about logistics disruptions. That is a challenge that we've been carrying out since last year. Uh, import restrictions that have been happening also uh, in the global market, especially in Europe for, for, fresh, for the fresh industry, for the fresh citrus industry. And we will also be mentioning about uh, some weather events that happen in specific markets as well. So for the Russia-Ukraine conflict, um, these have what are the main affectations of these global events? Well, it has really this uh, this 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 conflict has affect uh, all different through different industries. In the case of uh, citrus, uh, of course, there's been an increasing cost production um, energy wise. Uh, in gas, coal, uh, fertilizers that have uh, really affected all through uh, citrus production globally. We will review a little bit about where 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 was where are the main affectations of this of this increasing cost, uh, and it also have created now oversupply of citrus products in related markets. Uh, all of those products that uh, aim to be uh, destined to Russia or to Ukraine. Uh, we will be re 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 reviewing the suppliers that have uh, allocated those products uh, into other different markets, and that uh, uh, and that in related has created uh, an oversupply in specific markets as well. Um, as well as for logistics disruptions, well, as I mentioned before, this is a challenge or an or or a, or a event that uh, we've been carrying out since last year. Uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, left us this 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 issue with the with poor congestions, vessels availability, lack of adequate infrastructure at ports, uh, and port of uh, custom strikes. Of course, this is an event that has uh, affected more. Uh, markets than others, so we will be reviewing that as well. Um, in terms of the import restrictions, we will be mainly mentioning about the EU treatment regulations, the, the new uh, cold treatment regulations that have been applied in the, in the European Union for specific uh, suppliers, mainly uh, from oranges in South Africa. And then the weather events, we have different uh, across the world, different weather uh, events for uh, because of unfavor unfavorable weather that has caused um, different disruptions across the world. We will be in, this, in the case of citrus. We will be focusing focusing on flood floods affectation that have affected logistics, uh, on favorable weather affecting uh, delays and and shortage in production. Um, so we will also be pointing out which are the main um, markets uh, or main supplying markets that are being affected by these weather events as well. So um, Ben, if you yeah. Thank you very much. So first, we will do a very quick uh, global outlook of the citrus market. You know, a, a quick global overview. Uh, the global citrus production uh, output in, during the summer of 2021 and the winter of two of uh, 22, which is which pretty much covers both of the uh, seasons in the northern and southern hemisphere, have reached uh, almost 159 million tons. Uh, China is the still the leader uh, world production in, in volume, 
by accounting for 40, almost 45 million metric tons of these 159, uh, and it's about 28% of the global output. Um, in terms of regions, Asia is still also the, 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 the largest producer of citrus with 51%. Um, South America and the Caribbean produce 18% of the global output, 15% in the Mediterranean region, and 13% in the Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in terms of exports, this obviously changed because even that Asia or China in this case is the most uh, is the largest producer of citrus is not the case in the in the global exports. Uh, global exports, um, fifty two percent of the of the of the citrus exports are originated from the Mediterranean region, uh, which you can see above that it actually counts for just fifteen percent of the of the global production. But this region is more. Um, let's say is more focused on the export markets uh, that they that they can reach that's why they cover about 52% of the global exports uh, they, this region is led by spain south africa turkey and egypt mainly um, then there's a 20% uh, in global export from coming from from coming from africa 13% uh, coming from asia and 11% uh, coming from south america these are numbers uh, wrapping up the last season, both last season from the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. So let's move on to the uh, EU citrus market affectations. Uh, one of the most uh, affected regions uh, has been definitely the European Union. The European Union is, uh, if it's, it's not the largest producer, but it is where uh, the, one of the largest uh, regional consumptions have on, on citrus in all uh, throughout different products. So it's definitely been one of the most affected uh, in terms of production, but also in terms of trade. Um, energy prices increases in the U.S. affected the cost of citrus. Uh, fruit production in average in Italy, for example, have uh, gone to 15 percent, such as in Greece, Spain and Israel, all within different specific cases. We won't have time to uh, stop and analyzing and analyze all of these specific markets, but we will try to give you a, a good overview of, of how this cost has been affected in, in, in each of the main markets. Uh, there's also been an increase in transport cost, uh, cost again by the by the Russia and uh, by the by the Russia and Ukraine conflict. Also, together with the with already the, with the logistic disruption that we suffered in 2021, so the increase of, of, of transport has been. Uh, has has increased more than more than decreased throughout this year. Um, fuel, of course, it's one uh, thing that has affected the trade. Um, increasing production cost, as I mentioned before, uh, the increase in production cost for citrus show a 21% year-on-year increase uh, in March, and by 12% due to rising cost of fertilizers, electricity, packaging has also been uh, packaging and raw materials and labor. Has also been in 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 in, in, an, up, in an upward trend uh, with in the different uh, production markets. Um, this has left uh, three main consequences. With again, there's probably if we if we want to stop in the in the in and analyze more the the, the market, we could all obviously bring more consequences in specific markets. But in the EU, um, we have seen that the planted area in Italy and Spain has decreased. For example, in Italy. Uh, the dedicated to citrus food have substantially decreased in the last 15 years. Orange by 31% in the last 15 years alone. Mandarins by, mandarin by 18% or easy pillars. And for lemons by 50%. This means that a lot of uh, producers, speci specifically in the Sicilian region, have uh, decided to shift to other more profitable crops, uh, like tropical crops, for example, avocado, papaya. Uh, so they have swift, if not all of their production, some of their production to uh, these different crops, and this is as a consequence of the of the rising uh, costs that they have suffered. In Spain, citrus fruit reached some of the highest price in recent years, uh, driven by a historically low production volume and increased production costs. So a lot of uh, markets like like the spanish case it's not just the the input the higher input on in, in cost uh, increase uh, in cost it also has um, get together with a low production volume uh, that they have been carrying around so all these things together they have uh, you know they have really affected the market um, and the citrus production in all european countries is forecast to decline for the next season we will stop at this 
uh, when we talk about the output in 2023 for the next season, we, we will we will show you how it uh, has decreased and how the forecast or all major markets uh, will be decreased in, in citrus production. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about South Africa because South Africa is uh, one of the markets, one of the main exports of uh, of citrus into different markets, and and it's a very particular case because they have achieved. Grow, they've been growing in their export of citrus. It's not the exception in this in this year. However, they have been affected by different uh, uh, all of these different uh, events. For example, there's been flooding in 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 in, in South Africa citrus uh, main producing uh, regions. Uh, it also has affected road and port infrastructure uh, with shipments uh, delayed by weeks. Uh, they have been facing a lot of logistic challenges, uh, availability of vessels, port congestion, certain of trucking solutions during the most part of 2022. This pretty much has made more expensive uh, the FOB prices uh, within uh, South Africa. Um, so therefore, uh, it's it, it's a product that is being sell more in, in in the in the in the consumer markets. Um, the, and then they have faced another third uh, damaging, very damaging uh, event for their for their industry, which is the uh, European uh, import ban to to South African origins due to the false coding mode. Uh, so there's been a lot of talk about this issue as well. Uh, they pretty much it, it, this pretty much affected uh, severely affected exports to the EU this season for South Africa. Um, as I'm saying, despite these challenges, South Africa citrus exports grew around 3.7% uh, in volume from the last year. But it is very important to mention that this number, uh, this increase uh, in, in exports, it's actually uh, less than what is uh, what is eventually or or firstly forecast uh, in the South Africa as the South Africa citrus growers. This this number is actually the 160 million cartons that they exported in the in the in the season. It's actually around four percent below of the of the of what was estimated on the first. Uh, on the first uh, the estimation that they did, uh, obviously this four uh, percent was represented and is driven by 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 all these challenges that they that they faced. Uh, of course, you can see that in the FPO prices uh, of different products. These are just two examples uh, in lemon and oranges. Uh, oranges, uh, lemon. There you can see how uh, the cost uh, the or the average uh, FBO prices have gone down which has been also very damaging for for producers and in the case of oranges because of the be, be, because of the imposed uh, uh, coding the FCM code and regulations uh, and and also uh, um, uh, not enough supply shortage of supply in specific markets uh, orange prices actually have been have been up we can move on to the the next one. Okay, so we will review uh, other, in general, other important citrus market affectations. Uh, the case, for example, Egypt, which is the uh, leader provider uh, of oranges, um, for the 2023 and 2023 season, uh, there's been reported that it's been high temperatures above 40 degrees, which will or potentially could affect the next uh, citrus season. So this is Again, a one weather uh, event that might affect uh, one of the largest supplier of citrus. Uh, in the Turkish season, um, the, for the next Turkish season that is just or has just started in October, uh, there is no reduction of the harvest allowed. However, um, the, the season, it's already uh, been reported that is characterized, characterized by low demand and high prices that is really attributed to the high shipping costs. Um, the citrus harvest in Tunisia is expected to drop by 16 per, by 16 percent um, due to unfavorable weather that is experienced there. Um, citrus fruits in Ukraine uh, have have rise, The prices have risen uh, at above 74 74 percent over the year. Um, Polish citrus so, uh, prices have soared as well. Um, in about, about November, they reach uh, um, a historic uh, high over the year. Uh, citrus season in Georgia also is expected to decrease by 35% year on year due to again unfavorable weather uh, that is expected to to, to reduce uh, production and uh, exports to Russia are expected to to to, re to be reduced as well. Uh, the U.S. 
the U.S. has a different problem. Uh, they also have faced uh, unfavorable weather thanks to uh, due to hurricanes that have been suffered there. However, they also been carrying a continuous decrease in their citrus production thanks to uh, due to the green bacteria uh, that mainly had affected the citrus production in Florida. Uh, and South Korea tangerines have also been reported to be to uh, exports to Russia have decreased uh, substantially uh, due to disrupted logistics. So these are some some of the main major uh, affectations in the seafood market. We can uh, yes, thank you. Um, so this is what what I've mentioned in the first slide. When we will talk about a little bit of the a uh, 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 general outlook for the 2023. A citrus outlook. So we already have um, a forecast for the northern hemisphere that covers Greece, Italy, Egypt, Israel, Morocco, Spain, Tunisia, Turkey, and US. Of course, all of these markets have their specific forecasts and have their specific uh, affectations and movements in different products. But this is a general view of the northern hemisphere that covers all of these uh, all of these uh, countries. Um, so, in general, all citrus production it will, will decline 13%, which is a big decline for the northern hemisphere um, in covering all products. However, you can see there in the graph uh, what's, the, what's the, the decline in each of the products. So, for soft citruses, for oranges, for lemons, and for grapefruit. So, grapefruit will see the major uh, decline in production um, the next season, according to the forecast of the World Citrus Organization. Um, and then we also expect lower. So thanks to this, we also we will expect lower volumes, especially in the EU and the US markets, which are some of the main buying markets or importing markets. Uh, so lower volumes uh, product uh, product uh, producted domestically there uh, will 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 be expected probably more than more than ever. Um, logistic disruption will continue to affect profitability for 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 producers uh, around these regions. And, uh, and EU regulations will be key for market access. Uh, so, of course, this, uh, around these uh, regulations uh, that has been imposed to the EU will need to be followed closely because um, they have lifted a few bans for specific products. They have, they have not lifted a few bans for other specific products. So, this is an issue that will need to be still uh, be, uh, need to be observed closely because it will have Definitely a market affectation in terms of which will be who, who country will be supplying the much uh, citrus to 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 the to the European Union. For the southern hemisphere, um, that includes South Africa, uh, Argentina, Chile, Peru, and Brazil, uh, we still have no. Uh, of course, we still have no general forecast, but we do know, for example, that a few countries that like Chile, uh, Argentina, uh, have an uh, upward trend in their production. However, they're still facing a lot of uh, logistic disruption in, uh, in order to reach their main markets. They still they're very far away, um, as well as South Africa. They need to uh, uh, cover a, a lot of. Uh, they need to uh, travel high distance to reach their specific or their main markets. So this is still be an issue uh, for the next season as well. And also, uh, they will be, they will face tough competition in main markets in terms of volume and price because the main markets such as the EU, the EU and the US will be short in citrus. Um, of course, uh, there's a benefit for for all non-origin citrus uh, from the EU um, that will be probably able to export more. However, it's not just a country that will be able to export more. Uh, so they will face tough competitions in terms of how can uh, who or who can provide. The larger volume uh, at the better at the best at the better price. So uh, we can review a few trends that I think, uh, and, and according to the global uh, citrus organizations, still be in place for next year. Um, so the main trend that we can see for next year it would be definitely the lower uh, EU and US citrus production. Uh, this is a fact. Uh, it's been continuously been decreasing, so there's no reason to think otherwise for the next season. Uh, in, in, in this sense, imports from non-EU origins into these markets are forecast to increase throughout the year. Uh, freight costs are, according to Freitos, uh, uh, an organization uh, that uh, covers and analyzes uh, freights around the world, we've been uh, following closely, and according to them, 
for next year, there will be definitely a uh, decrease gradually uh, in, in freight costs, specifically sea freight costs. And this will probably uh, favor South Hemisphere suppliers, again, the ones that need to travel the, the, the most to, to, to reach their main markets. So they might have a, a decreasing cost in, in, in shipping cost in this sense. Uh, then there's a continuity or new regulations for shipper suppliers will be key for market taxes. We talk, I talked about this already. Uh, this will uh, this will keep being a big and a major trend on the citrus uh, specifically for european market and um, this will be a key in terms of who uh, will be able to uh, supply the european market and in which conditions if it's a call if there's still going to be a call treatment required for on, on for which specific countries um, again there's going to be a tough competition specifically for morocco egypt turkey and south africa as uh, some of these countries are the ones that are expected to cover the gap uh, on the shortage for uh, in, in, in the main markets. And of course, they will compete in volume and price. And then uh, there's a new trend that the, the, the World Citrus Organization have mentioned, which is the, that the citrus demand is likely to soften somehow in key markets, such as the European Union and the UK uh, Union in a, in a substantial way because of inflationary pressures so you you do you do remember that citrus uh, demand for citrus products and for citrus fruits went up when the COVID-19 uh, uh, spread because of the fame of having uh, different uh, nutrition as values for 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 the flu. Uh, this is uh, starting next year will start to uh, ease down. Um, we don't, they don't see a, a, a consumption going up again in a specific market, especially because of inflationary pressures in this market where people are consumers, uh, don't see a value on, on, on start on keep consuming uh, citrus specifically if they are, if they are high on price. So for me, in terms of the citrus part, um, this is for now. Uh, one, thank you, thank you very much uh, for that presentation on the on the citrus industry. Uh, Theo, I'm going to hand over to you uh, to look at the global nut industry. What happened in 2022, and what are the prospects for 2023? So, a brief introduction, and then get going with the with the global nut trade. Yeah, thank you, Ben, and uh, thank you, Juan. Welcome again, everybody. So my name is Theo, um, I'm a global market analyst and I cover mostly the nuts and seeds market. Um, for this presentation, I'd also like to mention that I'm originally from South Africa and before I, I used to work a lot with um, the agricultural economic side of macadamias and pecans. So um, I'm quite familiar with the production side also. Um, today I'll make a few um, agronomic comments on that also. Uh, so if there are some comments and, and uh, suggestions or anything like that, you know, leave them in the chat. Um, it will be interesting to hear also the comments on that. And that would be specifically on the first topic that I'm going to cover, which is about um, China's macadamia production. Um, and then I'm going to take a look at two more topics. The, the second one I'm just briefly going to touch on, which is world supply. And it's, it's a very broad, very general overview. And then the third one in 2022, we saw the effects of inflation and high food costs on, on nut consumption. So we're going to take a look at specific markets and then also the, you know, how it's going to change in 2023 if, if the economic situation changes. So let's get into China's macadamia production. Um, I think it's important to to keep this in mind. If you if you talk about nut production, it's a very very long term investment that you need to do. So if we take macadamias and other nuts are very similar. So for macadamias, after you've planted them, it takes about seven years before you start having a, a positive cash flow. So you can kind of say before you start making a profit an annual profit, so for that year. So if, if we take a look at macadamias, if you take a look at the, the graph on the right, um, as soon as your yields get about to 1.5 tons a hectare, then your cash flow for that year starts being positive. Now, things have changed a little bit with inflation and, and costs are higher and nut prices are low. So, you know, it could be eight or nine years. Um, but let's say this is more or less the general general timeline. 
And then from year 11, so four years after that, you start making back the money that you invested before these seven years. So um, that's that's basically how the cash flow works. And uh, like I said, it can change by a year or two, um, but it's very similar in, in most macadamia producing countries and it's similar for most nuts. So what is the cost of investment up to that seven years? Now, for most countries, it's about 3,000 to 3,500 USD per year per hectare, right? Um, and that's without your harvesting costs. So for seven years, that's about 20,000, 20 to 25,000 USD that you invest before you start getting a positive cash flow. So you have to get things spot on from the beginning. Otherwise, you know, if you make a mistake, you're kind of, you know, could be stuck with this up, up to 30 years, but for at least seven years before you know you made a mistake. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is something that, you know, for me, it, it's just a little bit bizarre what happened in China. So they're, they're a very big importer of macadamias, the second biggest after the US. And the macadamias are very high priced nuts. So it's a very good opportunity, you know, to, to, to make money. Um, but what they've done, it seems a bit rash. They just went and in Yunnan province, they went and they planted more than, than 200,000 hectares. But if you look at most academic research, uh, it says, look, you can't produce macadamias above about seven or 800 meters above sea level. So it just doesn't work. And there's a lot of academic research on that. Uh, there are one or two exceptions, but that, I mean, that's kind of the general rule. And also, like I mentioned, I'm from South Africa and it might be a bit anecdotal, but in South Africa, the, it's called the low felt where the macadamias are produced. And it's called the low felt because the altitude is lower. And then you, you get the high felt where the altitude is higher. Where they're producing mostly pecans and macadamias just don't do that well. So, like I, I mentioned, it's it's really weird that China went to like planted like 200,000 hectares in Yunnan province. Most of it is in uh, close to a city called Lingang where the altitude is about 1,500 meters above sea level. So if you think also about it, um, if from the previous slides, so, so it takes about, or it costs about 3,000 USD to maintain a hectare. So maintaining them for seven years is like, let's say, let's work on 22,000 USD a hectare times 210,000 hectares. So it's an investment of 4.4 billion USD. So quite a big investment. Um, and it's strange for me that the altitude issue didn't really come up. Um, there must have been questions about it, but you know that's my take on it. Now, if we go to the next slide, then we can see basically what happened with their production. So, in 2018, they had the 18th International Macadamia Symposium, which was in Lingkang City, and you know, very excited about macadamia production in in China. What's going to happen? And they said, right, so the high end estimates is China will in 2022, they're going to produce about 200,000 metric tons. Medium range, about 150, 145, 150. Low range, if things go, if things go sideways, it's going to be still at least 100,000 metric tons. So now four years later, we are in 2022 and the prop estimate is 50,000 metric tons. So, I mean, that's... You know, you can't call that a success, really. It's about a third of of what they expected production to be. Now, there's also another way to calculate this. So we know in 2015, they had at least 130,000 hectares that was already planted. So some of that was even planted before that. So some of these hectares are even, you know, 10 years old or so. But if you take that and you take the benchmark of, for example, South Africa, Australia, Seven years later, they should have at least 1.25 or 1.5 tons a hectare. So, you know, they should have at least by now been producing about 160,000 metric tons. My take, again, my take on it is it's because of the altitude, because in the, the neighboring province in Guangxi, where they also planted a lot of macadamias, um, the altitude is a lot less, and reports are that the that, uh, uh, the yields are much better. Production is much better there. So um, it will be interesting to see what's going to happen in you. I mean, now, if, if they're not having the success they should have, 
they could probably at least aim for about 1.5 tons a hectare. Um, then you get at least that annual profit. Um, otherwise, you know, they might rip all of this out and, and go back to the nuts that, that work in Yunnan province. Um, but just for reference, right? So South Africa is the biggest macadamia producer at the moment. So South Africa has an area of about 60,000 hectares, right? So, so if you compare that to China in total has about 300,000 hectares now. So, in any case, even if, if it's kind of a failure in yields, they'll still become the world's biggest market money producer. And that kind of also changes the, the world market for nuts because of these volumes. So, um, yeah, that's, that's basically, this is something that stood out for me in 2022. It's like China falling away short. With their macadamia production. Um, again, uh, yeah, so I, I, I would appreciate some comments and, and other people's take on this also. Anyway, um, we're going to go to the next topic, which is just world supply. Uh, for this one, I'm just briefly going to touch on this. If you take a look at the, the um, picture on the right, so over the last 10 years, how much production have increased? And it's a very steady increase. You know, it's a very clear trend. Um, and for the major nuts, like, like, uh, macadamias, uh, sorry, not macadamias, like almonds, walnuts, and so on, it's increasing. I and mean, then macadamias were supposed to increase significantly with China and Vietnam's plans. They were, they could have even come close to, you know, bypass beacons and come close to hazelnuts. So that, that didn't realize so far, but they could figure it out and there could be, there could be a change in the nut market, but overall. This increase in production is mostly because of an expansion of the area under nuts. Now, like I mentioned, if it takes about seven years and we, we take a look at, for example, the US. So the US, they have about 24% of the area that's already producing. So they've got like 24% more that's not yet producing, right? And that was in 2021. So we know at least in the next five to 10 years, um, almond production in the US should expand by close to 24%. You know, they might plant less, a little bit less this year because, um, you know, the, the situation is different, but if their forecast for seven years is they're gonna make a profit, they'll still be planting. So the supply side is kind of fixed and there won't, there's not a lot yet in change. There are not very big risks to nut production because in California, most nuts are irrigated so you can kind of manage, they've had like this terrible drought and they could still kind of manage the, the water given to, to almonds and pistachios there. Cashews, which are planted uh, mostly dry land, you know, they are, these trees are, are renowned for being drought resistant. So, you know, cashew production should keep in, uh, expanding. The only real threat I can see to nut production would be frost damage, which is something that you can't really manage, where you can manage drought, you can even manage wet weather, where there's a lot of pests, you can kind of manage that. But frost damage, because of climate change, that's that's quite a big risk, because what happens is um, with global warming, so the trees come out of dormancy sooner, and then you get a light frost and the trees already produce these buds and the buds get frozen. And, and your production just drops. So we've seen that in Spain this year where their production is like, um, you know, estimates vary between 25 to 40% lower than, than last year because of frost. Um, and it's also for a specific nuts. So cashews are, you know, they're planted in, in tropical areas, so they don't have, you know, chance of having frost, but almonds, pistachios, and also hazelnuts are, are the most at risk. But overall, this, the supply side is kind of fixed. So if we go to the next slide, then, um, you know, with supply being fixed, nut prices are driven by the need. And this, you know, I know it's kind of a broad overview, but nut prices are driven by demand. Um, and supply is increasing and people that eat, that eat more nuts until more or less 2020 in, in the pandemic, people were focused on healthy eating and they ate more nuts. But then after that, there was a big decrease. And on, on this graph, I've, I've put the US almond prices, like the export prices, compared to the FAO's food price index. And you can see where other food prices increased, not prices actually trended lower. Um, and that's because of the supply and demand situation. 
So um, that's all I'm going to say about the supply side. Uh, we're going to go to some specific countries and how demand was affected in these countries. So if we go to the next one, the next slide is the U.S. demand for nuts. Now the U.S. is the biggest, the world's biggest producers of the producer of nuts. So um, the dynamics is a little bit different. Um, but if you take a look at the slide on the left or the picture on the left, that shows the U.S. almond, their domestic shipments, or which is basically domestic consumption, right? That's about 7% lower year on year between January to October, right? Um, so that shows, you know, people are eating less nuts because almond is the predominant one. Pistachio uh, consumption was actually up. But if you take a look at pistachio and you take a look at the, the last one, which is cashew. So cashew consumption is down 15% in the US. Um, and what happened is cashews are, are more expensive nuts. So now imagine if it's high inflation and you're standing, because nuts are mostly sold as snacks and you're standing in the supermarket in, in front of the, the nuts section, you have to choose nut and you're gonna say, man, these cashews are just too expensive. I'm gonna go for something a bit cheaper. And pistachios is a good option. So we've seen the drop in cashews, but a little bit of an increase in pistachios. And then walnuts also um, down by about 2%. Now you can see the retail prices on the right. I chose the retail prices because we're talking about, you know, retail behavior um, for demand for nuts. But you can see like cashews is about 20, $21 uh, per kilogram, whereas almonds is about 11. So, you know, cashews is about double. That's why the, the drop in cashew consumption was more than in other nuts. Uh, if we go to the next one to Europe, we'll see something similar for cashews. Um, they're also a big cashew importer. Cashew consumption, or, you know, it's cashew imports, which is basically the same as consumption because they don't produce any cashews in, in the EU, down 16%. Again, that's because cashew prices are much higher. Uh, again, if you look at the, the two, Price graphs, I put them in two graphs just because if, I, if you put five on the same, it's difficult to see. But um, these are the prices, they're the same graphs, basically. Uh, you can see pistachio and cashews are the most expensive ones. Pistachio and cashews are the ones where we've seen consumption drop considerably. So um, cashew down 16% and pistachio imports, you know, from, from selector, selected countries, because not everybody has reported the data, down 14%. So the more expensive nuts again in the Europe in Europe um, has decreased. Overall, there's been a big decrease. Um, hazelnuts is quite an interesting one for me. Um, that imports into into Europe increased by eight percent. Um, my my take on it is that um, because twenty five percent of hazelnuts get turned into Nutella, and if you you know, once Nutella is produced, it has a shelf life of about 12 months. So if you buy hazelnuts now at a very low price and prices are very, very low, um, you know, if you buy that, you can kind of extend the life, you know, the hazelnuts and then the Nutella, it, it could be up to two years. So I think a lot of buyers are buying hazelnuts at this cheaper price at the moment. And then um, that's the reason for, for the increase in hazelnut consumption. If we go to India, it's a very, very interesting one. Everywhere, cashew consumption dropped significantly. In India, it nearly doubled. And we're talking about net imports because um, they also, in the past, they exported a lot of cashews to the EU. Um, they didn't export that much. So in total, it's about a, they basically doubled their net imports of cashews. Now, the reason for this is India imports cashews in the shell, then they shell it, and then it's consumed there. So their imports is at a much lower price, where in other countries it goes from, for example, Ivory Coast to Vietnam, from Vietnam to Europe. So that, that cost in between makes prices a lot higher. So in India, cashews are comparatively cheaper. And also, it's not just a snack in India. So people don't just buy cashews for the snack market. It's also a big ingredient in their cooking. So, you know, it's made made up, you know, they use it for curries and, and things like that. So that's why, you know, they, they've been the biggest market for cashews this year. Um, and it's replaced some other food stuff, some other ingredients. 
And then the rest, basically all of them also down. So almonds down, pistachios down, and walnuts down. Um, and then the price graph shows that if you if you take a look at cashews, the in shell exports, uh, in shell imports, but I've converted it to shelled, so it's comparable to the other nuts. You know, it's it's a lot, or it's basically the same as almonds, walnuts, and pistachios. Where in other countries it's much higher. So that's another reason why cashew consumption is is higher in India. The last one is China. Um, for China, I've added macadamias because what we just talked about, uh, that graph on the right, it might look a little bit stretched. Actually, it's not. It's just that macadamia prices are, you know, it's about triple the price of other nuts. Um, so so that's, that's why the graph looks like that. So macadamias, price is much higher and China is like a very big importer. So that's why it's included with China. We haven't seen macadamia imports decrease, um, whereas we've seen most expensive nuts decrease, and macadamia is the, the most expensive one. The reason for that is mostly because the people that can afford to buy macadamias, they've, they've stuck to macadamias, they can still afford it, even within inflation. Um, but other nut consumption also decreased a lot. For example, cashews, again, struggling. So that's what happened in 2022, and that was the effect of inflation. So the more expensive nuts suffering more than other nuts. So looking forward, we've seen um, the FIO food prices started to come down a bit. So we might see, you know, if households have, have a little bit more disposable income, we might see them go, you know, nut consumption in general picking up a little bit, and hopefully people will return to cashews because production is also expanding. But, um, you know, if they've tasted pistachios and they like it, they might, you know, they might stick to this. Um, so it's going to be interesting. But overall, prices should remain quite low for the foreseeable future just because of the, the supply that's that's been increasing and demand hasn't increased that much. So that's, that's my outlook. Uh, ben, uh, we'll go back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Theo. Thank you for that very, very insightful and comprehensive presentation. We're going to move on to our panel discussion and uh, I'm going to e ask each of our panelists to uh, briefly introduce themselves. But before I do that, we are running about 15 minutes um, over schedule. So we will be running over the hour. Uh, we will likely finish around quarter past for the attendees. Just take note of that. We will be running over. We will have a roughly 30 minute panel discussion right now. I'm going to ask each of our panel uh, panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Lucia, you go first, then we move over to Mehmet and then to Alton. And once you guys have introduced yourselves, uh, who you are, what role you fill at Tridge, and sort of a little bit just brief background, then we can move over to our questions that we'll be addressing. Uh, so, Lucia, over to you. Hello, everyone. This is Lucia Manrique. I'm a global logistics specialist uh, from Peru. We're mainly handling exports from here. Hello everyone, this is Mehmet. I'm Global Fulfillment Manager and I'm mainly working on the commodities, sugar, lentils, chickpeas business. So I'm going to try to answer a question on the commodities line. Thank you. Uh, Alton. Good day, everybody. Elton Grieve. I'm in South Africa, Global Fulfillment Manager for Tridge in South Africa. Main functions are sourcing fresh produce from South Africa, fruit, nuts, vegetables, based in the Western Cape and Brazil Natal, which is on the coastal areas of South Africa. Main focus is on citrus and palm fruit. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, so we have three questions to address today. Uh, the main, the main, or the sorry, the first one is: What are the major events that happened in your market in uh, 2022? Or, yeah, what are the major events that happened in your market in 2022? Uh, Lucia, I'm gonna let's keep the same order. Uh, I'm gonna go with Lucia first, and then Mehmet, and then Elton uh, throughout the questions. So, Lucia, over to you. I will try to focus. Uh, this conversation from a logistics perspective, addressing a little what we have experienced in Peru this 2022. In the first half of the year, we were still struggling with the harsh consequences of the pandemic in the supply chains all over the world. 
that disruptions in, impacted on ports closure, container shortage, lockdowns, bookings and availability, among other consequences. And therefore, transit times uh, had drastically increased due to serious delays and freight costs skyrocketed, being difficult for lots of farmers and agricultures to assume this significant um, increase by having to commercialize their perishable products in the local market. Although the outlook today looks better, we are still facing some cancellations of services usually offered by some shipping lines to Asian countries, for example. Um, insurance companies are no longer willing to cover damages as a result of delays in the transit times and consequently uh, with long transits the fruit condition is not optimal and that impacts the sales and the profits. Those exporters were forced to redirect their cargoes to other closer destinations in order to mitigate these risks, these risks or rely on our shipments despite they represent higher freight costs. Another factor affecting us has been the war. European markets are not as promising as years before due to inflation and changing the demand and pricing, forcing the suppliers to look for other markets not as attractive as this one. And talking also about the imports, we were impacted by the fall of more than 50% of imports of fertilizers coming from Russia, deficit that generated an increase in the demand and pricing, and with it, a harsh impact in the production cost of farmers. Hello everyone again. Yeah, actually, I'm not going to repeat the same things because, like, I think globally everyone had the same major events. But when you just uh, look more specifically for the commodities line, because you know, like uh, grains, chickpeas, lentils, like those are the main uh, consumption products, and everybody has to consume somehow, especially when the uh, world is going to global crisis, and they're reaching the like animal. A protein, so people were more into the pasta and grains to get like health lifestyle, at least like to survive. Because uh, when you just check like the commodities, one of the major actually uh, events, it was like droughts, foods, like very bad weather conditions happened. And uh, of course, conflicts between Ukraine and Russia. It was uh, like, I think, biggest uh, sounded event for 2020 because all the international markets, especially for the grains part, uh, they were shocked and they needed to find some solution somehow. That's why uh, all the countries, they were quite engaged with the, this grain corridor to just have something to get from Russia <clears throat> and Ukraine for the grain. And another thing like political tensions and restrictions about import and also, you know, Governments, they didn't want to import a lot to just support the farmers, but at the same time, like cost of the production was very high, so they needed to import as well. So when they changed the regulations, they kind of blocked the exports, but when they don't export, it was also like economically affecting countries. So it was very hard to keep the inflation. It was very interesting year, and we hopefully that the Russia and Ukraine conflicts will be solved somehow. And then for the 2023, we will have better expectation of the, at least for the, these grains and the gas energy costs. Yeah, Alton. Thanks. From a South African perspective, Juan and Theo have covered the major events that happened in South Africa during 2022. I think the important aspect is how these affected producers and suppliers in South Africa. It did have a big impact on the pricing, getting food to the market. The highest cost driver this year was the cost of getting food to the market coupled with production costs. We were also hit by devastating floods earlier in the year, just at the start of the citrus season, which resulted in a month's delay in some of the shipments reaching markets. And the knock-on effect from a market perspective in terms of the EU regulations is that markets like the Middle East and uh, China, Asia, certain markets were flooded with South African food as suppliers were looking for alternative markets for their produce. But in a general perspective, the figures for the citrus are up compared to 2022, which shows a good production year, despite all the challenges that were experienced. However, they are still below the uh, projected totals that were expected for the citrus season. 
from an Apple and pair perspective, still huge demands. Uh, suppliers didn't have major challenges except the ones highlighted in terms of logistics. And then lately in the table grape industry, we've seen excessive rains and flooding in some of the growing areas. Logistics doesn't seem to be a major problem at this stage. At this stage, it seems Mother Nature is the one that is the one that is dictating supply conditions and how producers react to this. Uh, thank you. Thank you guys for uh, for your input on that. Uh, let's move on to our second question, which is how have suppliers or buyers uh, responded to these um, major events that have happened, whether they be droughts, floods, um, changes in logistics, port congestions. Uh, so how have buyers and suppliers responded to to these events? Uh, Lucia, if you if you'll take first again. Yes, um, well. To mention an example for the citrus, this year has been tough as they have not experienced growth due to changes in the demand on some markets since they are no longer accepting CAT2. Um, and also as a result of all the logistics disruptions. But in general terms, this, despite these major events, the area exports in Peru have experienced a growth of more than 20% in compared to previous years. Thus, contributing to economic growth, also to employment generation and boosting the national economy. We have also surpassed our volumes and records, and we have become the world's leading exports of grapes, blueberries, and asparagus. And that trend is to keep growing and entering to new markets. So, um, despite still suffering the ravages of events such as COVID and war, Suppliers and buyers have moved on, and this has only generated more supply, more resilient supply chains uh, to be capable of mitigating these disruptions and risk by being more strategic, uh, strategic when it comes to decision making, taking into consideration critical factors like transit times, availability of the spaces, freight cost, and where we commercialize our products. So the goal for us is to try to deliver the products in the best possible condition, timing, and to be also cost efficient. Well, that's all for me. Thank you. <laughs> so actually, when we just uh, look at the commodities line, uh, everyone was very confused because, like, actually, the Ukraine and Russia conflicts was a big shock for like international market, and it clearly offered the lessons for the countries to avoid of heavy reliance on the you know imports for the main products especially so especially when we look to weight in africa price were like 60 percent increased in turkey we had so many tenders to just manage the uh, local conception and to secure to uh, our conceptions because uh, russia and ukraine they are the biggest uh, exporters and also Australia is coming after that, but it has also flute. And for 2023, it's going to be still like, I think, very hard times for the grains part. Also, when we look at the chickpeas, chickpeas had very interesting terms for the 2020 because there was very uh, shortage because of the droughts in some other countries. In Argentina, it was droughts, but uh, when you go to Australia, it was uh, flute, like, General weather conditions wasn't so good, and after prices were increased, and in Turkey we had some regulations that we could not import, or even though if we could import, and Turkey having like very strategic position to re-export, they had some quotas for the companies. They could just export very limited to just still secure to local uh, market to secure the local market, and. Of course, when you just uh, see that the price increase, energy cost, it was like increased 25% till now, and fertilizer, so it improves 53% in Turkey. And also when you just total agricultural input cost, when you just look at it, it was like 28%. So about the lentils, like for Canada, the biggest uh, lentil exporter of the world, uh, things went well over there. It didn't affect a lot. But when you just go to Australian part, because of the flute, they affect it. So still like there is enough supply, but process and grain market is always so manipulative. And India takes main role in that sector. If India will demand very high volumes, price will jump suddenly. 
but if India will keep silence, so price is going to be a bit down. So it's really hard to freeze, but in the 2022, chickpeas was the top product that was always going up, and Canada had very good advantage of it. Argentina, for the neighbor countries, they had advantage, and Turkey was having a bit difficulties for import and export part. I'll talk. Thanks very much. From a South African perspective, we've seen from the supply side, suppliers have preempted taking experiences from previous years, the logistics and both the natural disasters that occur in South Africa. They have preempted logistic solutions and focused a lot on creating logistic solutions in partnership with government and your shipping lines and logistics chains. And South Africa has obviously responded quite well to these where they were able to catch up with demand for the citrus season and still comply with both pricing and market requirements for South African food. We have learned over the years that when we do reach peak seasons, especially in the citrus and table grape seasons, there is a need to have a critical focus on logistics within the value chain from farm to market. And suppliers have responded well to that. The one that, that did catch some producers off guard was the lack of uh, trucking in South Africa. This year, citrus production overshot the expected uh, logistics chain volumes that were going to be processed, and that led to quite a bit of a panic, but was resolved. From a buyer's perspective, despite the increase in pricing, we're getting the food to the market and obviously a knock-on effect to buyers. The demand still grew. Grapefruit was obviously, as Juan indicated, was quite a big problem. There was a bit of a dip in price and demand, but the rest of citrus, we saw suppliers react quite well. But the knock-on effect from a financial perspective is that in order to absorb the logistics and other challenges in the value chain, not many suppliers have made huge profits during this time with many just breaking even. So as much as we have these challenges, the knock-on effect is always a financial one and it is yet to see how in the new season we will counter these. Thanks to the hosts. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you. And let's move on to our last question. Uh, for the panel discussion, what are some expectations for the upcoming year? So what are you guys expecting in your sectors or, or regions of the agricultural uh, your trade? Uh, Lucia. Yes, uh, well, the trend is to keep growing and entering new markets and maybe to keep surpassing the exporting volumes and records as we have been doing so far. Uh, here in Peru, the agriculture uh, never stop and it will and it never will, and because an, as a country we rely on this sector to contribute to economic growth. And well, uh, logistics-wise, although it is said that the actual chaos could be extended to 2023, for the upcoming year we expect for the freight cost um, for the freight rates to keep decreasing as they have been doing uh, this past months. And shipping lines will try to fight this slump as best they can, but it is a difficult fight to win as there's too much capacity uh, expected on most trade routes. And many efforts are also being put into being able to evolve supply chains toward uh, more digital processes in order to have greater visibility and traceability in each, in each, in each one of them. Yeah, about the process, like actually the Canadian Grain Commission has just released the uh, final forecast report for New Year. And it includes like actually lentil production amounts as well. When the report analyzed specifically for the red lentils, they can say that it's like one of the best crops of the last five, six season uh, they will have. And total production is much higher than the last year as expected. So it's estimated the total supply is going to be around like 2 million tons, including the carryovers. And also like 1.6 million tons of the amounts can be exported from there. So this is good crop and it's causing Canadian sellers to turn their eyes to India. As I mentioned, like India is very important. Uh, it's taking very important role in the lentil business. So uh, actually it's everything is just up to Indians demands and their local consumption because like uh, in the pandemic, they were aggressively stocking a lot of the lentils and grains. And so, um, and also like Australian production. Uh, is also important for the Indian demand. Australia has in the winter reason where it had food, but when we just totally uh, look to their forecast, it's gonna be like 800 
uh, thousand tons of the production anyway. So uh, generally, I think globally it will be like for the lentils part, it will be um, sub supply won't have any issues. But when we go to chickpeas, uh, Mexico, it has now food issue and for new crop, especially Mexico is very known for the big size of the chickpeas. Uh, they have expecting very uh, low quality. Uh, it can be like 20% damage of the goods. And also for the Argentina, they are going to finish the, all the harvest. And they also, in the Cordoba region, they had very good, uh, not, sorry, they had very bad uh, weather conditions over there. So uh, quality and the quantity base, it wasn't, uh, gave them good results. So for the chickpeas, for the next, here it's gonna be, I think, uh, the same levels. It's gonna be provided, and for the lentils, if India want to met, it's gonna be price maybe a bit decreased. For the grains, it's all up to Russia and Ukraine conflicts. If the things uh, are going the same way, if the this grain corridors will work the same way, uh, I don't think like it's gonna be a huge issue. But if the conflicts get more hot, then uh, where it would uh, face with grain issues for the next year as well, especially for the African region, because Africa is really a big importer for the wheat and grains from uh, Russia and Ukraine. It would affect them very bad. Yep. Thanks, Manet. From a South African perspective, projecting a good table grape season, which it just started and will uh, go over into February, March next year. Projections are that we will surpass the previous season, but not by much. The focus this year has rather been on quality instead of uh, the volumes into the markets. Producers have rather opted to focus on quality. From a stone and home fruit perspective, we've seen good feedback from producers that volumes will be good. The stone fruit season has been ongoing and is going to continue. We've seen good demand for that. But this year was a shift looking at more options towards air freight rather than sea freight. From a, a subtropical fruit, lychees, cherries, we're seeing a good demand, good production this year. Even in our kiwi fruit, we have seen larger volumes coming into production as the younger orchards start producing. And from a blueberry perspective, we, we do see a, a tough uh, year coming ahead. We obviously know that the competition from Peru, Chile, that's the South American region, is a competitive uh, part for South Africa, but we foresee a tough uh, year for the blueberry season. And moving into the rest of the year, we, we foresee that logistics will still be a challenge, but producers and uh, the, the associations working with producers have put in place mechanisms to counter this. From a citrus perspective, the Citrus Growers Association has already indicated that they don't foresee a major increase in volumes, but rather more quantitative or quality perspectives markets, focusing especially on the Middle East and Asia markets. So from a citrus perspective, the focus will be on reaching the targets, but looking at more how to manage pricing, logistics and quality within these markets. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you. For, uh, thank you all three of you for uh, for your great contributions and uh, for answering for answering these questions. So thank you very much for um, for all our speakers, uh, for our panelists, and then for our presenters. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Apologies for going a little bit over time, but I think it was very insightful presentations from everybody. Very insightful discussions, um, and. For those taking holiday, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and uh, we will be back next year definitely with uh, with more uh, Tridge webinars. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and the slides as well as the recording will be available afterwards. Uh, so the slides will be sent to everybody along with uh, a link to, to the survey, and then the recording will be available as well. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. And again, thank you for all our speakers. Um, have a great festive season. Bye-bye. Uh,